So let us welcome our speaker. Thank you very much, Shiva. That is very, very kind of you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. It's actually a pleasure to be, you know, just briefly at the school and to be surrounded by such an international group. Uh, and it's nice to have an international group to talk about a very international topic. Um, so, uh, the question actually was posed earlier, um, and here is the question, I should perhaps take a vote, actually. Um, the basic question really is not can we uh, maintain the planet in a sustainable fashion uh, while keeping everybody in a state of poverty, uh, can we do that while actually having everybody be rich? Um, I suppose a subsidiary question, since I put it in the title, what does physics have to do with that? Um, uh, and I'll try and convince you that thinking as a physicist, although many of you are physicists, is a very good way to get a first cut of all of these problems. Okay, so actually when asked that question, um, the public is surprisingly um, optimistic, um, foolishly optimistic perhaps. Um, so if you ask people, uh, become highly energy efficient, focus on energy, generating energy from the sun and wind, and you can replace coal and nuclear energy all at once. Um, uh, the other one that I like on this is this very annoying bank adverts. If you fly too much, as I do, uh, you're faced with adverts from HSBC Bank uh, that tries to persuade you that they're really smart. And here's a good question here. As they say, 0.3% of the solar energy on the Sahara could power Europe. And actually, I have a question for you. I should have given out clickers, but the question really is true, false, or fantasy? Remembering that the so, so how many people vote for true? There's a few, you're right. How many vote for false? Sort of equal number. How many vote for fantasy? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay, so that's so well, but but I would, I'd like to be discussing that at, at some length. Now, um, this is actually a physics talk, although I'm not going to bore you with too much physics. But I do want to discuss the principles about how to become an armchair expert. Um, and as those of you who will ever have had dinner with a theoretical physicist, who are the most tedious people in the world, because they always have an opinion and they're always absolutely right when faced with any topic, um, I'd like to persuade you to think like that. Um, so, I should say what the lecture's about. Uh, and I've got quite a lot in it, so I will be moving relatively fast. I do want to begin with a discussion of what I like to think of is of the thermodynamics of the planet. Thermodynamics is a discipline of science which makes use of the fact that because many moving forces are in equilibrium, uh, the world is governed actually by very simple principles. If you want to think about gas in a room, all you need to know about the gas is the pressure, volume, and temperature. You don't describe it by measuring the velocity of every single atom in the gas. Um, and that applies, interestingly, on a large scale, uh, in some interesting ways uh, on the planet. I want to move to a discussion which actually I think will parallel the last talk, at least those who were uh, in the school, which is a discussion about the scale of the problem that we have to face. And the message will be that if you want to solve the problem of renewable energy, you have to find a way of deploying resources on scales which are the size of countries. And I don't mean small countries, I mean quite big ones. Okay. And then I will spend some time talking about what the options might be for doing that. Um, the headroom for innovation on transformative energy technologies, which of course a large number of you are engaged in. Um, and I want to be encouraging about that. So there are certain things that I won't talk about. I won't talk about nuclear. Uh, you're not allowed to, it's sort of an unmentionable word in the United States, so I won't do it. Um, I won't talk about resource use for water, although anybody who addresses these topics really should, because that's very important. 
Um, I won't really talk about policy, um, although that's perhaps the most important thing, um, and I won't talk about climate change. Well, actually I will, um, just briefly. So I have a question for you in this room. Do you believe in anthropogenic climate change? Yes, I, mean, I think most people do. I mean, there may be some who don't. The reason that we have been told to believe it is a lot of data that looks like this. This should be very familiar to you. This is the measurement of atmospheric CO2 uh, in Hawaii, going back for 50 years. Um, this is the global mean temperature um, uh, uh, for NASA. And there's a sort of a lot of other stuff. Um, and we have spent a lot of time thinking about climate change by looking at lots of data like this and trying to convince ourselves that these are correlated. But of course, lots of smart people, and I mean smart people, uh, not the climate change deniers, there are a lot of smart people who look at things like this and say, how do you know that isn't a fluctuation? Uh, even if these things are correlated, how do you know that it's causal? How do you know that something else isn't going there? You know, an extension of um, the well-known fact that eating ice cream causes drowning. Right? So, it's very strong correlation between people who drown and recent consumption of ice cream because of course they've been at the beach. But, uh, now, there's been a lot of work done on this, and I think this is, this is now pretty solid, and even some of the uh, deeply grounded skeptics have come round. There was an interesting article by Muller in the New York Times later this week about how he described how he was no longer a climate change skeptic. But they, 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 there should never have been any doubt, because actually this is theoretically grounded in a way uh, uh, that is very difficult to avoid. So I would like to point out that a good theory is always the best thing to have. And I would like to remind you, if you don't know it, sorry, about uh, the theory of this chap, which is Fantiorinius, who's of course known as one of the founders of uh, <coughs> statistical physics, who published a paper in 1896 called On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature of the Ground. So this is how does CO2 influence uh, warming. And by the way, the idea was already 70 years old. Uh, but he quantified it with a very similar answer, an argument, and let me give it to you. Because then we can look at this argument carefully and decide why it's so good. So, let's begin by trying to calculate the temperature of a planet without an atmosphere, mainly Mars, for example. That's a very easy thing to do. Because, uh, one knows the incident solar flux average over the day, uh, on the Earth, this is 345.5 watts per square meter, a number that you should remember. That hits the ground, and some of it is directly reflected, a fraction alpha, alpha is the albedo. Um, for the Earth, it's about 30%. The remains of it is absorbed, uh, equilibrates to a temperature, and then is re radiated at the temperature of the surface, and the radiation uh, energy is uh, given by the fourth power of the temperature. And the number, which is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and just to prove that we really know it very well, here it is. Um, if you do this analysis for a, plan, for a planet in the place of the Earth that doesn't have an atmosphere, you get a temperature of minus 18 Celsius. If you do this calculation for Mars, you get the right answer. The Earth is warmer than this, and we're grateful for that. And the reason is, of course, that there is an atmosphere. Now, atmospheres are more complicated, but let's take a particularly simple atmosphere that we might call Venus, which is opaque. So if the atmosphere is opaque, what actually happens is that the surface temperature radiates up, and it hits the atmosphere, which we'll assume is equilibrated at some average temperature Ta for the atmosphere, and that then re-radiates, but of course, it radiates up and it radiates down. So some of the energy which goes up comes back, solve these equations, and you get a temperature of plus 30 degrees C for the Earth. By the way, if you do this calculation for Venus, you get the right answer. Um, now, 30 degrees is, is a little bit uncomfortably warm. 
Um, but it does, by the way, place an upper bound on what one might expect. Um, so it works to the partially transparent cases, of course, because not all of the atmosphere, not all of the energy that goes out through the atmosphere uh, gets absorbed. Some of it goes through, there's a fraction of epsilon, partially transparent, and for the Earth, we know that number is 0.78. And you can solve that, and you get a temperature which is pretty much close to the global average of the, of the Earth's temperature. Now, by the way, the purpose of this is not to determine this temperature. Can measure that. The purpose of this is actually to refine the argument so that a few parameters here and changes in those few parameters can be quantified. Okay. It's a vastly simplified model, but it's very accurate because it behaves on what is a physicist I would call a summary. What goes up must come down, what goes in must come out. Okay. Uh, the atmosphere is well mixed, and these parameters are very well known. If you double CO2, you change that parameter, one, one of these parameters by 2%. That involves a change of the, what's called the radiating force signal balance, by about 1%. And the important thing to realize, of course, is that 1% is quite small. When you are dealing with small things, you can add them up. You can add up the response to changing CO2, to changing methane, to changing the solar flux, to all of those things. Things which are not able, additively appear as nonlinearity, so called feedback, and of course there are many of them that appear to be mostly positive. But the number you get out of this is 1.2 Kelvin. And the consensus as a result of very complicated modeling, including all of those other things, is 3 Kelvin from all of those feedback effects. And it's worth looking at how the models have changed over a century. 1896. This is Arrhenius' prediction. By the way, the reason he got 5 or 6 Kelvin was because he didn't know the parameters very well. Um, when the parameters were better known, the same theory comes down here. But over all this period of time, we actually have not changed our opinion on this. And it's not because we've got better data. It's because we've become more sure of the foundations of the theory. Uh, so, uh, now, that was a slight preamble. Um, and now, um, I want to move into the next phase of the discussion, which is to ask for, you know, the needs of the planet and the sources of energy, and let's just try adding up all of the numbers. And there are very few places that energy can go. It comes in from solar uh, flux. So this is the mean radiative of solar flux. What happens to that, well, the stuff which isn't, with the stuff which isn't, reflected is redistributed into other degrees of freedom. It's redistributed into thermalized infrared energy, which we call heat. It goes into wind energy, it goes into wave energy, and it goes into rainfall. And about the only other thing which comes from the sun is tides, which of course is not good. And, 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 sorry, but, and, and tides are um, somewhat important from the, from the sun and from the moon. Uh, but these are the main ones you have to talk about. There's, there's, there's nothing else to this. So if you wanted to capture that energy, you're going to have to capture it in these various forms. Well, how much do we need? Um, a US-centric number. The US average power consumption is 3 terawatts. 3 times 10 to the 12, 3 billion, 3 million million watts. Um, that's 5 billion microwave ovens. Um, it is also the solar flux on 10,000 square kilometers. And that's actually the area of Delaware and Rhode Island, two small states that probably we could do without. Um, uh, maybe somebody here, somebody here from Delaware. Uh, but you know, so you know, by the way, that's the Sahara question. Um, uh, Ten thousand is you know, that's a lot, and it's also a little. Now, um, let's get a bit more global about these numbers, and. You may not be able to see this, but I'll point this out for those of you who can't read it from the back. I'd like to go around the world, but actually we'll start with states in the US and countries of Europe on this side, and look at uh, how the energy is spent. Because the way that policy, science, technology goes, in fact, is driven by a great deal associated with geography. 
This is a map of the population of various states against their area. So Alaska is up here. Um, Rhode Island is down there. And so these isobars across here measure population densities. One square kilometer here, 43, which happens to be the world average, is here. A thousand is there. Um, if being uh, UK centric, you add uh, uh, countries of the United Kingdom on top of this, England, Wales, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland is somewhere, I've lost it. Um, uh, uh, you notice that they're significantly more dense. And if you put Europe on this, you'll notice that of course all of the countries of Europe, with the exception of the Nordic ones, are more densely populated than the average. The US is less densely populated than the average, and that's one of the reasons why energy policies are different. Take it a bit further. If you know the population density of people per square mile, and you also know the energy consumption per person, which is on this axis, then you've got another plot. Can we turn that thing off? What am I standing here? I don't think so. Um, so Population density here, so densely populated countries up here. Uh, here's Bahrain. Um, and Bahrain, of course, is an example of a country that's densely populated and uses a large amount of energy per person. And if you calculate how much energy Bahrain uses, it's, slightly, it's about 12 watts per square meter. The world sits right in the middle. The US, of course, is up here. It's a relatively lightly populated country with a heavy energy use. So here's the United States, here's Iceland, here's Australia. Um, uh, poor countries, of course, sit down at the bottom. There are poor countries which are very densely populated. Here's Bangladesh, here's in India. And there are poor countries which are rather uh, frugal with their energy, and that includes places like Congo and Namibia. So Africa sits down here. Again, on these bars, you can look at isobars, which is energy use per square meter. Remembering that the energy comes in per square meter, so this matters. So now let's, the previous plot is now here, and it's collapsed. And I've put mm, rough estimates of sources of energy that you can get. So if you go out in the desert, um, which I knew where I was talking, if you go out in the desert, um, uh, well, Arizona will get you about 300 watts per square meter on, on, on average. Desert sun is up here. If you're in the UK and it actually happens to be sunny, this is what you get there. Um, if you now look at conventional technologies which can convert this, here is concentrated solar power, which will get you about 20 watts per square meter. Um, and you notice already that Singapore and Hong Kong are on the wrong side of that. Uh, so, these are two countries that are going to be importing energy for quite a while. Um, uh, solar photovoltaics is sort of sitting around here. Typical installations will get you five in a good climb. Uh, perhaps next generation technology will move this out. Um, wind power um, is, well, it's probably slightly bigger than this, but wind power on average gets about two and a half watts per square meter. Energy crops are down here standard energy crops at least. And you notice, by the way, that that explains why energy crops are probably not a great idea in the United States, which is rather close to that line, but they're not a bad idea at all in Brazil. Because Brazil is a sunny country, uh, it's relatively lightly populated, um, and you don't need much of it to do this. Um, so, um, <coughs> so the, the way that we will that countries will choose their technologies to populate this are going to depend a great deal on their energy. Now, uh, let me try and let's talk about solar. A lot of this is a, a lot of this meeting is about solar, about solar technologies, and I want to use the next few slides to explain why it's so important to get this right. This is the so-called concentrating solar resource of the United States, courtesy of Enel. Um, plotted in how much power can you get in terms of kilowatt hours per square meter 
per day. Um, I prefer to use watts per square meter, and then you have to divide by 24 because there's an hour per day factor in there. It doesn't matter. What you see is that, there, is that this ranges by about an order of magnitude between sunny places like Arizona and New Mexico and Colorado, um, and not so sunny places like Seattle and the Northeast, uh, not to mention Alaska. Now, um, so let's look at the prospects for solar PV in the US. As I said, the US uses three terawatts of power, average over the day. Last year, um, the industry reports that two gigawatts of solar power was installed in the US. And about, that's out of about 10 gigawatts worldwide. Now, it's worth remembering that when some solar power installer quotes you a gigawatt, goes to, go to a kilowatt uh, of power, that's, that's kilowatts peak. And that assumes that you've got uh, one kilowatt per square meter of insulation on it, and you've held the thing at 25 degrees C. I'm not sure how you're supposed to do both things at one time. Uh, and in practice, you will get, if you're lucky, uh, 20 to 30 percent of this peak. So if I take that number, this is 0.02 percent of total demand. Uh, so despite the fact that you see these things going up all over the place and they're enormous, uh, is it actually going to be possible to scale this up? So let's look at technologies by volume. Now remember that when we're dealing with a solar photovoltaic technology, we're dealing with an electronic technology. So what other electronic technologies do you know about? Well, this is a 12 inch silicon wafer. This powers, of course, the modern technological revolution. This is, of course, single crystal. Um, so PV is, of course, made out of, out of polycrystal. Um, but there's a lot of this about. In the first quarter of 2012, the industry shipped, likes to measure things in square inches, shipped 2,033 million square inches, which sounds like a lot of stuff. Uh, Actually, if you convert that into sensible units, that's 1.2 square kilometers, and that's what 1.2 square kilometers actually looks like. Um, and conveniently, by the way, this is uh, a, a, a global foundry staff, it used to be AMD um, in, uh, in New York. And so, you know, this is the size of a typical uh, big industrial plant. This is a very big plant. Uh, but nonetheless, that's, that's 1.2 square kilometers. How much um, was that 2 gigawatts of PV? Well, that's actually about 10 square kilometers. Um, so that's more or less the size of an airport, at least an airport in the West. This is Phoenix Airport, which is you know, about uh, 3 kilometers from end to end. So, if you want, so, so, that, so that was your 10 square kilometers, which was actually installed. Now, suppose one of you lot invents a 100% efficient solar photovoltaic technology. How much land area would that take? Well, 3 terawatts if you wanted to power the whole of the United States at 300 watts per square meter, because you're in Arizona, is this much. That's the city of Phoenix. It's a big, sprawling city, actually. That's, of course, 10,000 square kilometers. That's 100 by 100. Um, that's a lot of stuff. Of course, if you do it at current maximum efficiency, which is 20 watts per square meter, you're now occupying, uh, well, you know, here's Phoenix again. This thing here actually is the border with Mexico. Uh, there's some canyon thingy up there. Um, so you're using a large part of the southwestern United States. If you do it with current PV, this is what it looks like. You can see part of California. Um, and if you decide to install this PV in somewhere where it isn't very sunny, that's how much space it takes. Um, this is why Northern Europe is not a good place to install solar photovoltaics. Um, so, so what you should understand is that whereas this kind of thing is, has the feel that it might be doable, um, that really is pointless. 
So what matters is efficiency, manufacturability, cost, and geography. Now, before going out of solar, we should look at wind, hydro, and wind. As I said, the energy comes in in solar. Where does it go next? Um, so how much power is available in wind energy? So here is uh, some installation, which I think is probably somewhere in the North Sea. Um, and more or less the biggest windmill you can buy um, is this thing, which is called an E126. The reason it's called 126, it has a 126 meter diameter. Um, and it will give you 7.58 megawatts if the wind is blowing steadily. It weighs 6,000 tons, remember that, because we'll need that number later. Okay. How many uh, windmills can you put down? Well, it turns out that a consequence of fluid dynamics and the Navier-Stokes equation is that if you don't want to slow the wind down, you need to place them about 6 to 10 times the rotor diameter. So now we can work out, and this the area of the rotor is that. The power per unit area then gives you um, 18 watts per square meter, and the best installations will give you a practical capacity of 35% of that, which is about 6 watts per square meter. Interestingly, that's very close uh, to current PV. And the reason is actually physics. As I said, the atmosphere is well mixed. It turns out that there is a very efficient coupling between wind in the atmosphere and the temperature of the ground. If you want to see that coupling in action, uh, you can see it most effectively in a hurricane, which really build up to enormous energies. Anyway, so what this means, if you want three terawatts out of this, you need about 5% of the US land area. And that's also just about believable, but you can calculate how many windmills you actually need, um, and it is a big number. What about hydro? Hydro is very interesting, and this is where our partition fails us, sadly. Here's the Hoover Dam, a famous photo. Um, uh, that actually generates a lot of power. Um, 4.2 times 10 to the 9th kilowatt hours, that's a lot. So where is that energy coming from? It's just coming from the gravitational energy of rain. Uh, because it rains in the catchment of the Colorado. Um, and if you estimate the energy stored from the annual rainfall, the energy stored is, of course, mass times the gravitational constant times height. And you can work out the average power per area of this, and this is about 0.3 watts per square meter. That's unfortunately rather low. It turns out that conversion of that initial solar energy through the wind into getting water up into the atmosphere is not as efficient as we would like. Um, or we don't have high enough mountains. Uh, so we can't get very much back out of this. And it turns out, actually, that if you work out how much is actually generated, um, uh, it turns out effectively what you get out from this number is a power density which is much, much smaller, about a few times 10 to the minus 3 watts per square meter. Nonetheless, it's very useful because nature has done the concentration for you. In this case, although this looks like a big dam, you've only got to pour concrete over this bit, but there is an issue of cost. So, now let me just remind you then of some of these numbers because they need to be kept in mind. This is the amount of energy that's available in Arizona, 300 watts. You can get this back, concentrated solar power at this level. This is, the, this is what you will get out of solar photovoltaic. Biomass, which I don't want to talk about, um, currently is running in the 1 to 2 frame range. You can get stuff from where tides are available. In tidal streams, in certain places, it's, it's quite good. Wind is also quite good, but it tends to be localized. Rainwater, we've mostly tapped to wind. And this is what the US needs. That's the 3 terawatts divided by the area of the United States. Um, so we have a factor of a thousand in the US to work with. In other countries, as I pointed out, it's either worse or better. I'd also remark that well, in the US, we tend to focus on issues of a sustainable economy coming from the fact that we have solar and wind and storage, which, as I will point out, you need to make solar work, and a grid infrastructure that produces a sustainable economy, 
In other parts of the world, the equation is different. In other parts of the world, where there is no grid, and there is nothing, of course, if you have solar and storage, you have, you have lighting. If you have solar and storage, and you have refrigeration, you have uh, um, you know, food storage, so that uh, half the population of the world doesn't have to trace uh, you know, the average 10 miles to the nearest town to buy food every day. Um, and you will, if you will also, if you have lighting, then of course you get education and healthcare. Um, the equation that we have to solve in the West, I think in many ways, is, is harder to come back to this. Because we have to do this based on an economic model which is very different down here. Um, if you take the view that the goal of introducing new technologies um, is in fact to provide uh, education and healthcare to the one or two billion people who, uh, uh, who don't have access to it, you're perhaps able to pay a little bit more for it than we would up here, where we actually spend most of our time having the renewables compete with the profligacy that we already have built in. So you should learn that. Yeah. In the end, by the way, if you begin as a scientist looking into, renew looking into renewables, as you all do, you start thinking about technological fixes, and I will insist that technological fixes matter. After a while, you however realize that everything is about money, so I'll leave this out, so this is Einstein looking at the poor, and as it says, Einstein discovers that time is actually money. Uh, and that becomes uh, an important piece. So the next thing is, what's actually the value of energy? For most of the time that the human race has been active as economic beings on the planet, um, energy was really a unit of currency. We were, by force, living sustainably, but about 200 years ago we discovered we could dig stuff up out of the ground and burn it. Um, that time is ended, and the way that you can tell that it's ending is by looking at some elementary things. So there's something which is quite well known, I think, to economists, and it's called the Hamburger Rule. Um, uh, here's ground beef, it costs you $10 a kilo, roughly. Um, I, I, I made this view graph in Cambridge, so this is Tesco's best, but I, mean, I, I, uh, I suspect it's still here. Um, here's a car. How much should this car cost? Well, actually, you can look it up. It's in fact upon the Civic. Uh, its price is $16,000. It weighs 1,200 kilos. It works out $13 a kilo. It turns out that if you want to discover whether you're overpaying for a luxury item, try the handler. Weigh it, multiply by the price. Um, uh, this works for very large numbers of things, unless they're being procured by the Department of Defense, uh, in which case the price goes up. It used to work for battleships, by the way, but it doesn't. Now, why is that? One of the main reasons for that is that the cost of things now that you buy is essentially their energy input. So, um, cars are made of steel and things like this, and steel, if you buy it, it costs roughly a dollar a kilo. And indeed, about a third of the cost of steel is an energy input. It costs seven, so it actually takes seven and a half kilowatt hours in the best factories to make a kilo of steel. Now, what you can do is you can take one number and divide by the other and assume that it was all energy and ask what the implied cost of energy is, and that's indeed 13 cents per kilowatt hour. If you live in Colorado, you're probably paying about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Typical number of now, of course, if you're running a big factory, you don't pay 13 cents a kilowatt hour, you're paying about five or six. But nonetheless, these numbers are really approaching. Aluminum is even closer because aluminum is much more energy intensive. So, but, so aluminum anyway, so this is, you know, it costs about two and a half times as much as it's about this. And, and, and the energy input is about two and a half times as much. Here's hamburger. Hamburger is interesting. You have to allow for the fact that producing beef is rather energy inefficient. Um, if you eat hamburger, it gives you one, one kilo of hamburger will give you 1.9 kilowatt hours. Um, uh, but there's about a factor of 50 associated with the inefficiency of raising, uh, of raising beef. Here's a litre of diesel. Wheat flour, by the way, is much better. 
This is the calorific efficiency of wheat flour. But notice how all of those numbers turn up to be the same order of magnitude. You can try that with large numbers of things. Uh, you, know, you can even try it with fancy rugs, if you remember the fact that it may have taken somebody a year to make it, uh, and they had to eat during that year. So I discovered it even works in Pakistan. Um, now, uh, so these numbers are all coming here, and so the point is that energy is a very large cost of the input of all of the things that go in. Now that turns around in the other way. If you look at that wind turbine I told you, um, uh, according to I don't know, wind turbine price index, that thing will cost you $10 million. Um, it weighs 6,000 tons, and that's $1.50 a kilo. Now, that's also an interesting number because this equation works in reverse. And the reason it works reverse is you say, well, if I'm going to use this to produce energy, which I can sell at 10 cents per kilowatt hour, how long do I have to run this before I make a profit in this three and a half years? If you do the same thing for solar panel at a dollar per watt, it's four years. And because we're getting convergence on these two sides of the equation, all of a sudden, these things are becoming uh, valuable commercial things to do. And that is a change which, of course, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. But inexorably, we're crossing back into an economic system which, where energy actually is money. Now, uh, one example of this, you may have seen this, this is the escrow for solar. And this is pointing out you know, the investment, capital investments in solar energy, the selling goes to 2007, it keeps going up. And the government likes to show this because there's this blue bar down here, which is US government R&D, which clearly generated the green bar, which is venture capital investments, and the red bar, which is solar public equity. Now what actually changed over that time was really the price of oil. What actually changed is that the oil price grew, and when you got to about here, a canny investor would look at this and discover that they could make money. And so, uh, so solar has been growing very, very rapidly, um, as has wind. Uh, so you know, this is what's happening with non-hydro renewable sources um, over the last years. Again, this is nice data from a nice article from, from Enrel, which has sort of collected a lot of stuff here. Um, so you notice that bioenergy is essentially flat, geothermal is way down here, um, wind is now 4%, um, and solar unfortunately sits down at the bottom. This is indeed growing exponentially, you just can't see it yet. It's indistinguishable from the axis. Remember my point about you having delivered 0.02% of capacity. Um, uh, but certainly for wind, for the time being, um, things are moving rapidly. So, a recap. The physics part is we actually have an interesting equipartition of energy amongst the sources. So the primary source is solar, and that trickles down into other things. And we've now got to a time where the payback for the energy used in construction is a substantial fraction of the lifetime. And for really about the first time in 200 years, Energy is actually money. There is very, there's, there's very little free which can be done up. Um, that's not to say that there aren't lots of non-renewable resources out there, um, but the price of the bit, but it's no longer easy to get them out, um, and it is possible to change the cost curve from one to the other. Um, so we're not going to make energy cheap, but I think now there's a financial condition to get to a sustainable energy economy, because the money is energy. And the EU would actually be a lot easier if it would actually recalibrate the euro um, in terms of kilowatt hours or some sensible unit. And we could all go back um, on an energy standard for currency. Uh, and that might actually simplify uh, the way economics work. This is happening. So a reminder, sources of countryside. Energy uses, however, are points um, and the balance between where the source is coming in and the uses go out is a very interesting one also, and we need to play with that. As I say, a reminder, 
particularly important actually in the developing world because the developing world will practice. In China, for example, the reason for investing in, uh, in, in renewables is as much pollution as it is anything else. Um, and you know, what you gain actually is if you have photovoltaics and storage of refrigeration and lighting in a small village in Africa, is of course education and food storage and vaccination. Um, it is immeasurably valuable. Um, and we have to find ways of making sure that that value gets through. And it's for that reason, by the way, that I believe that the biggest chances of real entrepreneurial breakthroughs may actually come out of the third world and not out of the US, because the US is stuck with a complicated economic model. So the last bit of my talk goes back to technology. As I said, it seems to be very hard to do all of these things. Um, how are we actually going to get there? Um, in the end, it's material science. If you look at the things that we need, photovoltaics, or solar fuel, we need batteries for storage, we might need, in fact, uh, superconductors for electrical transmission, or most likely for, for more efficient motors to power those wind turbines. Um, uh, we need uh, efficient thermoelectrics for refrigeration and scavenging. We need LEDs for lighting, more or less have the latter one, and things like membranes for water purification and desalination. And as you go down this, you go from large area pervasive technologies to point sources. Um, and I remind you that you, if you're working with photovoltaics, are working on the hardest possible technology. Because you're working on a technology that depends on nano size and has to be delivered by the square kilometer at a price that can be done. And we have no examples of, it, of, of implementing wide-scale electrical materials technology unless you include the power grid for copper wires. Um, uh, so it is a daunting problem. And if you want to find a way in, you have to find a way in through a set of technologies where there are cracks in the door, either technological or economic, that enable you to work on. And I want to talk about one of those because it's an enabler in many directions, and that's badness. Um, why badness? Well, if you're in the US, um, badness are a big motivation for vehicle transport. The rest of the world doesn't care about this so much. 69% um, of US oil use is for transportation. Um, it's about 14% of energy consumption. It produces nearly 2 gigatons of CO2 a year. That's about 30% of the US's total. It has been going down, actually, as a proportion of the total, but it's still it's very large. Interestingly, there is a technology, or some kinds of technologies, which are already there, lithium batteries and consumer electronics, and there is a, what you might call a weakly disruptive path to implementation via hybrid vehicles. You can go to a fully battery-powered material in, in vehicle in steps. Battery is also immensely important um, in stationary applications because, of course, they have to be used to mitigate variability in renewable sources such as wind and solar, either on very small scales if you want them in your house, or on very large scales if you have them. Now, just to look, by the way, how big the market for batteries is, it's, it's actually rather big. Um, this, is all, this is back in 2008, it's sort of out of date. Rechargeable batteries, uh, market growth still, I think, at 30, 35% a year. By now, I think it's more or less overtaken primary batteries, and they're already in things like this, and they're even in things like this. Um, so this is a car. It's the Chevy Volt. You could buy one. Um, uh, and this is what the battery looks like. Um, now, here it is. Well, unfortunately, it's a five and a half foot long battery. It weighs 200 kilos. Uh, and it costs $8,000. And at the end of all of that, it will drive your car 40 miles. Um, uh, that's a great advance, but it's clearly not good enough. And the question can be, how do you make it better? Here's a look at battery technology over the centuries, frankly, because it hasn't improved very much. 
Lead acid is back here, and so this is power per kilo or power per liter, depending on whether you're weight or volume sensitive. <coughs> and the battery which is in there, which I will say Argo National Labs is very proud of because it invented the battery technology, uh, is up here. Um, and you see the number here is about uh, 300, 350 watt ounce per liter. Gasoline is 12,000, so on this scale, gasoline. Um, so it's about, it, it's factors of 60 to 100 of uh, my weight or volume. Now, you can ask, is it feasible using principles of physics that you know to build batteries which are an order of magnitude better than this? Um, and the answer is, that the, 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 is yes. Um, um, and I show it down the bottom for those of you who like it. It's possible to imagine a semiconductor junction which has an inbuilt electric charge which can store density, and in this case, density uh, which would come from the sun, which would generate electrical pairs that would separate themselves on this scale that would, uh, that would generate power densities of that order of magnitude. And this isn't an entirely theoretical device. You can almost build this. You need MBE and oxide growth and various things to do that. Uh, but it's, it's uh, in principle an order or two orders of magnitude better than this stuff. And of course, this is why batteries are so bad. If you look inside the battery, this is what it looks like. It's got an anode and it's got a cathode and it's got all kinds of stuff. And this is big on the scale of a few microns and it's an absolute mess. On one side, of course, one could be very proud of having engineered the technology which got you that far. Uh, but clearly, there is a lot of space to go, and that space is driven uh, by aspects of fundamental science. Um, it's also unfortunately the case that it's quite clear that it will be very slow to take this technology and manipulate it continuously so that you get onto a completely different technology path. Maybe not impossible. Since the invention of the lithium ion battery, it has improved steadily at 3% a year. 3% a year over a long period of time will get you a long way. Uh, but there's still a long way to go if we're in a hurry, so we probably need better ways of doing this. I would also like to point out that there's a real problem with the current way we think about technologies. That battery that I showed you, uh, only one third of the weight of it is the stuff that we would actually call the battery. Two thirds of the weight comes from power electronics to make it work. A strong casing so that if it blows up, nobody dies. There's a big energy density in batteries. Safety engineering, all of this kind of stuff. And engineering from the top down is very hard. It's already the case now that with solar panels down to a dollar a watt, the main cost of installing a solar panel is you know, the electronics, the packaging, and the installation costs, and the permit fees, and paying for the guy to climb the roof. Um, these are the born companies of technologies. So we need to find ways of producing materials which are defined on the nanoscale and uh, manufactured by the ton. Uh, so in the next few months, I'll explain how to do this. Who should lie? Sorry. <laughs> What is we don't know how to do this, but you will figure it out. Let me give you an example of the value of predictability. This curve up at the top here is Morsel. This is you know, transistors per die, and this is numbers of years, and this is drawing a logarithmic scale since the early 60s. Now, of course, it's very nice, and everybody makes a big deal about the fact that it's a logarithm, but the advantage of this curve mostly is its predictability. The point is that if you sit here and you say, well, I want to go from 2G to 4G, you say, my goodness, that's awfully expensive. It will cost me $5 billion to build the factory to do that. Which it does. About the same as the cost of building a nuclear power plant. However, you can borrow money from a bank to build a factory because you really understand exactly what you're building and you're not going to get any surprises, unlike the case of the nuclear power plant. Battery technologies it would be lovely if they were on this. This is the roadmap for battery technologies. It begins with things that we know. This is 
year 2013, and then it starts discussing new technologies entering in 2015 and 2017, and these are chemical compounds. But by the way, by the time you've got to 2017, there's a, there's a lithium ion which uses Li2MXO4, where M and X are transition metals to be named later, because we don't know what is going to go in there. And by the time you get to 2019, the roadmap has introduced an entirely new element called UNC, which stands for unknown, high voltage, high capacity cathode. Um, this simply isn't a way to build a technology. Um, and the only solution actually is science. And the science involves really understanding what you're doing with materials, to modeling, new methods of making things, actually new manufacturing strategies, and new uh, characterization methods. Um, how we get there, I'm not sure, but I think that the nanotechnology fab of the future is going to somehow look like an interesting amalgam of this and this and that. One's guess is it will not be any single one of all three, and we will need to do something there. So my last slide. Uh, sort of a personal view of where we are in all of this. If we start from science, the thing that most of us in this room do, I am modestly optimistic uh, that we can get there. It's a very hard problem, but there are enough renewable sources of energy, and there is enough space for new technology that uh, that ingenuity should win the problems are containable. There's nothing that violates the second law of thermodynamics. You need maybe tens or hundreds of billions of dollars of investment, but that's all. The economics, I think, is an interesting thing, which is imbalance. Every, the installations event are going to require multi-billion dollar investments on very uncertain technology paths. But what makes me feel positive about that is that I said that energy is now money. So energy is now expensive enough that it's possible to imagine that renewable technologies don't all get strangled by the next fall in the oil price uh, or by uh, some explosion of fracking technologies. Uh, the place which is really troubled is geopolitics. Because the incentives in those countries which have the greatest embedded capacity namely green natural gas roads and oil, will be the slowest to innovate. They are, however, the countries which have the greatest capacity in principle to do so. And the countries which have the biggest need to innovate have the least money. But they will be the fastest to take it up. So, echoing, I think, the last talk, rather than a focus on global climate change trying to get treaties to reduce CO2, the right thing to do is to understand how to get the technologies in the place where they're going to make the most difference fastest. And that's Thanks. Um, chemical energy is always an order of magnitude larger than electrical energy, is always an order of magnitude larger than mechanical energy, is always an order of magnitude larger than magnetic energy. Um, and you should understand why that is. Um, so the, uh, um, there are you know, potentially in some places big possibilities for storage of energy through essentially reverse hydropower. So places which actually have a dam and have a sea, uh, you can imagine doing that. And that's provoked interesting thoughts in Europe, for example, about having uh, solar farms in the Sahara, superconducting cables to Norway, dams pumping the water up and down to load balance. It turns out to be not crazy. I mean, on the scale of, you know, if you could raise a few billion, you may be able to do that. Short scale, um, hydrogen is a, is a complicated one. It turns out that, that uh, the, the main problem with hydrogen is, is that it's very difficult to get its energy density per unit volume. So if you want to use it as a transportation fuel, for example, it will never, it will never work for planes unless you want to uh, um, start building Zeppelins again. And it's very difficult for cars because uh, we haven't yet find, found methods of rapidly getting hydrogen vehicles. Um, but if you wanted to go for chemical energy, my favorite would actually be methane. 
And so converting things to methane, methane is, is rapidly compressed. And it's also quite clear, for example, in the US, that we're going to have an intermediate technology for vehicles, which will probably involve compressed natural gas vehicles. Because with the price of uh, methane having gone down, um, it now becomes uh, uh, sensible to introduce that. I noticed in Chicago, in a period of six months, all the taxis are now compressed natural gas. Natural gas. Of course, they've been like that in Europe for a long time, I understand, uh, but not here. Um, the biggest trick, actually, with working with, with methane is that the chemistry of methane is very hard, and that making methane um, is not easy. So there's a, uh, there are potential breakthroughs associated with trying to understand how to do reactions with C1 chemistry, uh, which, were, which are necessary to do that. Um, but I don't think that one should assume that any of these technologies are really out of balance. Um, hydrogen has turned out to be a very difficult one, partly because, while it isn't necessarily a bad idea, the infrastructure costs of installing the hydrogen economy uh, turn out to be very big. Um, so that's a sort of a rather long and maybe not completely useful answer to your question. But it's a yeah. I'm aware of a lot of the new fuel technologies, like uh, all kinds of things, uh, whether plasma-based energy or pyrolysis-based right. energy, and all algae biofuels, right. and other bugs, biofuels, and plant biofuels. Are any of those, uh, or a combination of those, practical for transportation? Well, that's okay, so there's an interesting one. So let's take biofuels at the moment. I just like said that biofuels scares me for the wrong reason. So the problem with biofuels is that current biofuels, for example, ethanol, first-generation biofuels, um, uh, uh, are not very efficient. Right. So you will typically get 1.1 1 .1 to 2 watts per square meter. However, it is turning out that you can make money that way. And so the technology has got to the point where maybe even without subsidies, if the price of gas is high enough, it will be worth uh, taking corn that otherwise you should be eating and converting it to biofuels. It won't make a big dent, but it will make somebody a profit. And the net effect is that the price of tortillas will go up, so it's not a good idea. Um, so, uh, cellulosic biofuels is a, is a kind of an interesting one. I'm not sure whether the supply is enough. Of course, if you go to places like Brazil, um, then these are very sensible technologies. So it's interesting to notice that Brazil is probably leading the development of some of these things for very good geographical reasons, as I was pointing on an early plot. Brazil is, of course, a tropical country. Things grow fast. The population density is rather low. They've got going on this because, of course, they have a secondary crop, which is sugarcane, which they've been able to use to, to kickstart this industry. I think a lot of people, and there's an expert right there, will tell you that algae might eventually do this. So, Sue Carter, Sue, do you want to comment on whether you think that algae will get there? Uh, algae will get there. The, the biggest problem with algae right now is it's too expensive. It's, it's off by a factor of five from gas prices. Uh, so the challenge there is to figure out how to make it do it cheap enough. Right. But the advantage of algae is it's a three-dimensional technology rather than a two-dimensional one. Because basically you can put it into a big vat and you can circulate it. And so it doesn't take up that much land area. Crops take up a lot of space. We don't really want to use a lot of space for the fuel crops. So I, but, and, but algae uses a lot of water. So, um, you know, so then one gets into other resource issues, so it's, uh, um, but, the, by the way, the wise thing to do at the moment, scientifically, of course, is to back in all of this. I mean, I, I talked in particular about you know, a particular kind of battery technology is being used in a particular place. It's much more sensible not to pick one thing, but to pick a myriad of things and begin to see if they can invest the pizza's game. Anything about the say, cost efficiency of fostering a change in lifestyles rather than the research uh, So, say, creating um, public transportation or creating bike paths, is there anything that fosters lifestyle changes within the people? Do you know like, which is, on, if it's on the road? Or... Yeah. yeah. Um, I, that, that's, that's an extraordinarily good question. So, the, so the, is this on? It looks like it's gone orange. Um, 
So, so, so the answer is firstly that they don't. So, um, but it's a very active area of research. Because there are two sides to this. One is how much does it cost to change people's lifestyle? And the second thing is, how do you know? How do you actually leave it? What's the least cost way of, of uh, getting people to take a bus? Um, and the, you know, one of the things which I think has been missing in part of all of this discussion is the engagement of social scientists along with the policy issues to make that and, I know, and I'm aware that it is happening. Maybe there's somebody in the room that knows more about it than I do. Uh, but Indeed, there's, a, there's another way you can imagine doing this, because it, you see, it, it is clear that... Um, by the way, some of the comparisons you heard in the last talk about uh, you know, Britain having a, having a low energy footprint um, is... Uh, uh, one has to be careful about that. It's easy to do things by not having manufacturing. Let me ask you a question. So Arizona, where do you think that is in terms of energy use per head? in the states of the United States. So, you know, what does it rank? What would you think? High? You think it would use a lot of energy per head? Yeah. Actually, I think it's 42nd. And the reason for that is it doesn't have industry. So, so, th so that, that also reminds you that, that in fact, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of energy use is actually in stuff. Still. So some of those things we're actually quite efficient at, and if we stop doing them, it ends up, you know, we're sending them to Singapore. Um, and so it may not change the global balance. But, there are, but I think there are certainly local things that we don't, which, which wouldn't be, you know, you don't enforce it. Um, I mean, for example, if you live in Chicago, um, you know, it's happening the way it is. So I happen to have just moved to Chicago, um, and I moved into the city. And the city of Chicago is really vibrant at the moment um, because lots of people want to live in the city of Chicago because they don't want to commute from 50 miles out from the house that they just got foreclosed on. So, so, so in fact, you know, things like you know, economic crises can tilt these things very rapidly. So, I, think I think a subject where, where work is beginning to be done and needs a lot. You don't need the mic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can type. <laughs> First, I would like to thank you for your very nice talk. So, uh, my question is that uh, uh, in the case of renewable energy, as you mentioned, there should be a portfolio of different scenarios like solar energy, solar thermal, wind, and hydropower, or something like this. So, and also you mentioned that, for example, in the case of lithium-ion batteries, we have 3% increasement is increasing in efficiency per year. So, uh, what, do you, uh, what do you see the future? Is the future belongs to this very slow increase of these technologies, or do you think that there should be a breakthrough, really a breakthrough uh, for future years? I, I actually think that there probably has to be a breakthrough. Um, and I think it's, as I say, you know, part of my argument against uh, you know, standard photovoltaic technologies are, you know, it just shouldn't look like that. Look, I mean, let, let's see. You know, if you were starting without using anything, would you use silicon as the element to absorb light? It's a very bad light absorber, right? You wouldn't do this. Uh, it's an indirect bank at semiconductor. It's in the wrong place. So you have to make it really thick so you get enough electron hole pairs. And then you spend all of your time trying to get it out. The only reason that we're using silicon in photovoltaics is that there is an embedded technology which came from something else which is dragged in the world. Um, now, you know, I don't know whether it's quantum dots or organic PV or something else, but I'm convinced that, the, that, that those just look better from the point of view of basic science, and there's no reason that they can't be made cheap. So similarly with lithium-ion, which people have thought about a lot. I mean, the fundamental problem with lithium-ion for a car battery is that it's using a transition metal oxide. And a transition metal oxide contains an, an element which is, which is heavy. And therefore is a bad thing to have in there. And all of the 
progression in lithium-ion technology has been to gradually get in a little more lithium and gradually reduce uh, a little more transition metal. But actually, in the end, if you take the transition metal out, you have dust. So that stops somewhere. Now, you know, whether or not the, new, the next battery technology is going to be lithium air, lithium sulfur, um, or, you know, or flow batteries for stationary or something like that, I don't know. Um, but I actually think that, that given some time and some money and some real force, those technologies can be invented and will be done. So I, think, so I think there'll be a breakthrough soon. You, you yeah, I was going to make a comment. I think one of the things that gets ignored in, in these type of arguments and, and related, I think, to the silicon is the role that lifetime plays in all this. How long do the materials last before they fail? Yeah, sure. yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, batteries are really short-lived. Windmills, some of them are not, you know, dry quickly. Silicon, one reason why silicon has made it so far is that we know it lasts for 50 years. Hmm. Right? And that's going to be, and that's fundamentally, and that might be fundamentally more important well, I mean, I, th I think the answer, I think the, well, I, look, I, I agree. But the lifetime is important. Li 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 indeed, lifetime is important. But by the way, um, uh, if actually you make money by the end of the life, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter. You know, I mean, paper actually is a, you know, I mean, paper has been a very useful technology for a very long time. It doesn't last very long. But it turns out that for what it is needed to do, it's actually very good. If you recycle everything, that's true. If you don't recycle it, if you don't recycle it, right. so, so then, true. right. And, and by the way, the next part of my talk would have been on entropy and recycling. Because you understand that recycling is all about entropy. So that the, uh, um, but, I mean, there, there are many aspects to whether something works, and Sue is much closer to than I am to, to the shop end of all of those things. I, 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 I would also like to take a view that, you know, imagine you come back in 200 years. You know, what technologies do you think there will be on hand? We assume that by that time the, the ingenuity of you and, and, and your children and your grandchildren will have been enough to have invented optimal technologies in certain areas. What do you think those will be? I think one can be pretty clear about some of the general characteristics that they will have in certain areas. So that's why I think you might as well go there now. Right. Um, but you know, but it, but, it, but it's a gamble, and it's only your career. Right? <laughs> so, question. Yeah. So as you mentioned, and also the last lecture talked about the human ability to mobilize and innovate in crisis and when it's needed. Um, we've done that before, but I guess what's my concern is. Well, first of all, how many and how badly people suffer in that crisis. But then secondly, what gave us the opportunity to mobilize was that we could uh, just increase the use of oil and natural resources. This time, the crisis is that we can't use more of those. So will we have enough energy to actually build only solar, solar plants and wind farms and could you get yeah, I mean, so, it's quite, so, so actually, I mean, the first thing is that there's actually quite a lot of energy still available to be dug out of the ground. Yeah, but if we can't pump it out because of... Right, but, in, but, but so, I mean, we may decide that we don't want to. Um, uh, but there is still a lot of stuff down there that gets increasingly difficult to get out. I suppose the other thing to be bleak about this is that it turns out that humans have not always been so successful when cultures have bumped up against capacity. Uh, you know, the Roman Empire collapsed and was left by, you know, a thousand years of the Dark Ages in Europe. It's happened periodically through civilizations where actually local civilizations have got to a point where they have grown beyond the capacity uh, to live within their means. And many of them have failed. Uh, so I don't think it's a sure thing, actually. I mean, I, I, uh, it, 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 it's... Um, it, it may not be pleasant and we may not be successful. I mean, I, I, but, um, so that's another reason I think that the, the question which came from the last talk is that if you tell somebody that, well, you know, 450 pounds per million is the break even, they say, well, okay, tell me when we get to 449 and I'll figure out something to do. I think that is, of course, dangerously complacent. So a lot of what we actually have to do is to find the levers that will actually make things happen. 
and I'm entirely in agreement with the, with the last speaker, that says that trying to imagine you can get some kind of global agreement on, 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 on behaving nicely <coughs> is not really likely to work. Um, it is probably going to be that we have to find a way of producing a successful technology solution, or at least a successful wedge, and get it in there and avert the catastrophe. So, I think the other thing to come back is, if you do come back in 200 years and we'll be successful, it will be because uh, you know, a few thousand or 10,000 people actually managed to get it right in the face of everybody else. As I say, you are bad. So, uh, what is he doing? Uh, no, bad? No, good question. So the microphone is going to the board because what things would like to use? So, of course, offshore wind depends on how far offshore you're prepared to go. So, um, uh, if you go to Europe, offshore wind is probably one of the best bets because there's a large shallow sea um, uh, that can be heavily populated with wind. Um, if you go to Western Europe and the Western United States, uh, wave energy is actually believable. We don't have very good technologies for wave energy, uh, but if you just work out, you know, the um, I forget what it is, I think it's about a kilowatt per, per meter of coastline, sort of standard wave energy. Um, at certain places, um, uh, tidal energy works. So, you know, th there are places you can go where just because of geography, there are big tidal flows, which actually could be, could be mined. And, and it's all, and so, uh, uh, and, and all of these things can play a role. They tend to play a role locally. Uh, but but um, but I suppose one of the things I failed to make the point, you know, you're not going to try and solve the world's energy crisis just by solar or just by wind. We will need to find ways of using all of these things. Um, and, 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 and tide, uh, and again, in a few places, hydro, although we've used most of the hydro already, um, uh, are, are valuable. And there is geothermal, which as somebody pointed out the other day, is relatively flat, um, and, uh, and and is probably not very effectively exploited. Um, I mean, lots of uh, uh, you know, I was surprised, for example, that, that when I moved to the US, I, you know, I, I finally got fed up with the increasingly hot summers in Cambridge, and therefore I installed an air conditioner um, in, in Cambridge, England, we call it this. But of course, you use it, you use that also as a heater. So you use the air conditioner, you just run it backwards in the summer and you use it, and you use it as a heater. Um, and of course, if, if you run things as a heat pump, they're very efficient. Um, and it's astonishing how little use we make of really rather basic technologies like heat pumps, uh, which collectively, if used widely, uh, would be very effective. And the reason for that is quite simple. Uh, these things are expensive to install and they produce a return only over a period of about five to ten years. But after they get start producing returns over a period of two to three years, people start putting them in. Um, so there's sort of, there's, there's, sort of lot, there's lots of spaces actually to be creative in all kinds of ways. Energy scavenging for things, right? So that why, you know, why should, I mean, this laptop, which almost catches fire because it's so dumb and hot. Admittedly, I probably should get a Mac that was more efficient, but it would be, uh, uh, um, it's sort of ridiculous not to have energy scavenging technologies in here uh, to make this thing much more effective and that it would need a smaller battery and all of those kinds of things. So there are a whole host of little technologies here and there uh, that after they've introduced after they will introduce will be part of the mix. I once had a claim that uh, renewables could easily compete with way more issues of subsidies, but I'm not sure it's really the way Well, I mean, so I suppose it is so the, the answer. Um, well, um, yeah, yeah, no, go, go get some pizza. No, no, no. Uh, 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 <laughs> gosh, I didn't realize I'd made you that hungry. Um, 
Yeah, well, so, um, was it, so, the, so the question, I think the question there is what's a subsidy? Um, well, one, could, one could argue, of course, that oil is very heavily subsidized all over the place because it's being given away for free uh, when, it, when it's actually a valuable resource. Um, it's certainly the case in some countries, of course, that oil is very heavily subsidized uh, because you know, it's the only means that the population has of living and therefore to keep the prices down, um, oil is subsidized. Um, the other thing is you know, the cost of electricity varies enormously from place to place. Chicago has really cheap electricity because it actually has too much power. I'm not kidding. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they kind of overbuilt um, because the US has such a bad grid, it isn't connected to the rest of the country, so it can't really sell it effectively. But if you go to Hawaii, you're paying 40 cents a kilowatt hour for your power. Um, so, there, so, there are, so, there, so, for example, so that means, of course, that there are market efficiencies which allow you to, uh, to introduce. Things. But I suppose the one thing to, to note is that uh, the so-called regulated uh, energy industry um, is anything but. It's certainly not regulated for your and my benefit. Um, so there's a large amount of fixing in the system throughout, and we lose them. Tax breaks, subsidies, feed-in credit, feed-in tariffs, and all of those things. It's a very complicated space, and it isn't fair. Um, the, uh, so I suppose what I'm saying is I don't even know how to make that comparison. You know, at what point do I know that I've got a fair price for this versus a fair price for that? Um, but the other side of it is that they're close. Um, I have a question. Um, in terms of the consumption of energy, do you think there could be a breakthrough that would uh, allow us to, instead of increasing the energy use, you know, make it, say, saturated or even go down. It could, for example, uh, it's known that um, a large fraction of energy is lost through windows in buildings. And I believe it's like 10% or 20% or so. Um, you know, another example is not too long ago, we used CFP tubes in TVs and, you know, uh, all kinds of um, information displays. Uh, but um, it's also obviously highly inefficient and liquid crystal display technology is now, you know, saving energy uh, quite significantly. So could there be breakthroughs in terms of using energy uh, that would change the picture completely? Um, well, I mean, so, I mean you know, if you like the big success you mentioned, right, which is LEDs. So, um, so lighting, um, no, aside from the energy cost of creating the stuff. Um, uh, you know, you, you can now buy something which is actually 100 lumens per watt. Now, that, now since lumen is a, use of, is a unit of energy, that turns out to be pretty much close to 100% efficient. Uh, and that's replaced, you know, light bulbs which were 10% efficient. Um, and that's made a noticeable dent. But right? I, mean, I forget exactly what the number is for that. Lighting about 20%. So. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's a, you know, so, so that for example has been a substantial change. And actually, if you look at power usage in the United States, it has grown down. I mean, so, I was going to mention that liquid yeah. crystal displays is fundamentally non energy efficient technology. It's a light switch. You're, it's polarized. You're cutting off. Huge percent of the energy that comes from the light bulb. Right. So, 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 it's better than the CRT, but it's still pretty bad technology. Sure. Right. But, but, but there's space, but there's space for improving that right. technology, you can prove that. which it will. Yes. So the, um, uh, but I think the, the, the real challenge with all of this, and, and certainly, you know, insulating your attic is a very good idea. Right. Uh, putting in double glazing if you don't happen to have it is is is, is really important. Um, uh, those things tend to, the problem with housing, by the way, is that the typical turnover of housing is 50 years to a century. And the cost of retrofitting is very, is very difficult. Light bulbs you buy, you know, you know, once every few months, computers once every couple of years, so the technologies turn over very fast. But I think, you know, but the, but the idea that the big growth in the use of energy is surely going to be in China and India and in Africa. And, and as the last speaker said, by and large, that's probably a good thing because it means that people are getting richer. So the, so the trick is, in fact, 
you know, you know, it's a sad thing to say this, but we shouldn't be worrying so much about doing it here. We should be worrying much more about doing it for the benefit of, uh, for, of, of the developing and indeed the rapidly developing world. Because the danger really is that if China installs the same level of infrastructure in the same bad way that we have inherited in the United States, uh, you know, we're in big trouble. Um, and, and it's very likely that they, that they, that they will do that. Okay. Um, I just, um, okay. So, in the past 10 or 20 years or so, we've had this huge, well, let's say 30 years or so, we've had this huge boom in technology, right? Silicon chips and things like that, right? And the idea is that every, like, five years or so, there's a technology that prompts the one that, that was before. So my question is that within the PV industry, do you suspect that, let's say, all the solar cells that are being put up right now with, let's say, 15 to 18% efficiency are going to be trumped in the next five or six years with, you know, 40% efficient solar cells, which are just as expensive? And even though these things have lifetimes of 20 years or so, but it's the fact that the technology is moving faster than you know, the degradation of the Well, I mean, I think it would be nice if that was the case. Um, <laughs> Well, so I mean, two things. First, firstly, the, firstly when, you, when you talk about silicon technology, silicon technology hasn't really changed in 40 years. I mean, it's become much more complicated, much more, uh, you know, it's just become smaller. We use different oxide materials. We have different methods of doing this, that, and the other. But fundamentally, we're riding, we're riding a single technology road. Um, the, uh, now, um, I, th I think that, that solar power will change if it becomes pervasive. If it's just a matter of a few people putting solar power on their roofs in California, that's likely to stay with a similar technology for a while. If, however, you get solar power so that it's going to be a major source of renewable energy for the nation uh, at the 10% level, all of a sudden you're going to have to build it in factories that could produce a you know, 100 square kilometers of stuff a year. And I don't know how to do that with polysilicon. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think that, so, so, the, so the solar power is successful, the technology must change. If it just rumbles along in the way that it's doing now, even though it's growing very rapidly, uh, it, it's, un, it's not obvious that the technology will change because indeed at the, at the scale that we're using it now, it sort of doesn't need to. It's a, it's a, I think it's sort of a different argument because, um, you see, the, I suppose the, the main point is this, that if you're going to install a solar panel on your roof, it's going to cost you a fortune anyway, whatever it is. Right? Because you're actually going to have to pay an electrician to put it up there. There are, there are half a dozen middlemen taking cuts along the way. You will have to get permits from the local, uh, local authority. You will have to pay somebody to come and inspect it. And all of these people are not going to give up their jobs very easily. And that's already now a very substantial fraction of the whole solar installation. But, you know, it doesn't make any sense to, that's not the future of power generation, is putting PV on But it, but it, but it isn't, right? So the future... <laughs> right, it does not so, practical to do that. Right, right. So, so, the, so, the, fu so, the, future, so the future of power generation is very large scale. It's very large scale. Yeah, that's right. And so, uh, so I think when you get to very large scale, there's a possibility then for really revolutionary technology. So it's getting a little bit late, maybe just one, two more questions, so please. Well, I guess the problem is that we can't just sit and wait until it becomes better. We have to use it now so that it becomes better. Because it only becomes better with volume. If we just sit there and say, okay, I'll wait for the 40% commercially available PV module, then we can wait for a long time so it will never show up. We just have to start right. buying the ones that are there so more are produced and more. But I, mean, I, but, I suppose, but I mean, I think the content of the last question is that it's not obvious that that helps. In the, in the sense that, it, in the sense that what, what happens is that you, is, is that you can actually end up supporting a, uh, um, you know, analogy might well be steam trains versus electric trains. Okay. At some point you want to go from steam to electric. 
Um, yeah, you do, you're not supporting the electric train industry by continuing to buy steam trains. Yeah, but if there's no market for trains, then you then need you, electrical trains for so. so, of course, that's why it's at some level necessary in various ways for governments to intervene to make sure that things happen. You see, I have a sort of a different view about what might actually happen. Is remember that it, is that groups of technologies together are very valuable. Going to an Indian village and giving somebody uh, um, uh, cheap solar power isn't very helpful if I don't also give them electrical storage and efficient refrigeration and very good lighting. And as I point out there, those cluster of technologies, when you put them together, all of a sudden begin to be much more valuable in other ways because you know, it turns out that then it's cheaper to introduce vaccination and the cost of your vaccination program actually goes down. It saves people money because uh, you don't have to walk to the market every day to buy food, which can in involve a hike of you know, five miles or so for some people. So that means that those people who would otherwise be walking for food could be economically active and could be doing other things. Um, so, so, thinking in a, so thinking in a purely technological space about a single technology, is, is, I think, very, is, is, I think, very dangerous. And then you might be prepared to put up with a less efficient technology because it happened to be cheaper or more robust or something else. Um, and so, for example, you know, one of the things, if you, I mean, I talked about fancy batteries. It would be a very good idea for somebody to do work on lead-acid batteries. Um, lead-acid lead, lead batteries have been optimized uh, for starting cars, for producing large cranking power. Um, uh, they're pretty good at storing energy, but the standard ones that you can buy are not the right thing that you want to use to power your house. Yet you go to uh, many countries in, in, in the developing world and you'll find people with stacks of lead acid batteries in the corner, either because they're using them to power the house or when, or when the, the light goes off and things like that. There are much more efficient and, in fact, probably cheaper technologies that nobody's spending any time on at all. And the reason they're not spending time on this at all is because there isn't a market in the West. Um, so, 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 you know, bringing the economics together and finding the markets to go with them is an important thing. I just, uh, I just wanted to point out that in terms of development in, in the so-called developing nations, it doesn't always have to be the same thing as, as you know, the Western nations. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen this with specifically with telecommunications that a lot of countries have just skipped that whole land bank business and mm -hmm. gone straight to wireless. Sure. So I think in terms of development, we, we, have, we don't have to think about saying that, okay, their um, lifestyle needs to be equivalent to ours, but it needs to be more like how do they develop within their own culture, within, within their own sort of you know, way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, see the, I mean you, you, you could imagine even a different way to answer, to answer your question from earlier. So lots of, lots of people in developing countries still live in villages. And actually, villages are rather nice places to live. I used to live in a village in England. It was a really rather nice place to live. Of course, in the West, everybody lives in cities because you have to. Why do we have to? Um, a lot of it is associated with a concentration of resources in a place that everybody can share because it's more efficient. If you have local generation of energy, you don't need to do that. You can stay living in the village. You don't need have So indeed, there's, there's a possibility that as you say, that, that so-called developing, because developing countries are, you know, are a huge spread even within a single developing country, could jump stages and not do the kind of things that we have done. And one of the dangers I see is that it's sort of natural for them to do things like build a power grid and build big roads and build several hundred airports, uh, where it may not actually be necessary and there may be a different set of options. 